Hello, this is a thing about assembly language programming in Windows specifically right now, but um, I plan to maybe branch out and do some Linux and some DOS a little down the road and stuff, but uh, just for now, this is just sort of a quick intro into how to get started with a like Microsoft MASM kind of a intro to assembly language. I feel like it's kind of the definitive intro. Anyway, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using a Windows XP virtual machine, not for any real specific reason other than to uh, sort of have a clean slate to work with because this virtual machine is mostly bare. Um, my regular PC out here has a lot of like different compilers and assemblers and crap installed. So even though I have tried to reduce the amount of like just confusion there this one has next to nothing installed so it, this is a this tutorial or whatever this video series potential series first video is being made at the end of 2020 as I speak so don't think that it's outdated but anyway most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about goes all the way back into the early 2000s a lot of it and even into the late 90s or the 1990s um, it still applies for the most part so you know, and going forward for the next decade or so or more or less, I don't know, it should apply as well. So what I'm doing is basically MASM 32-bit because 32-bit is a good middle of the road. Once you go to 64 or back to 16-bit or anything, um, things can start getting a little bit strange. So 32-bit's a good entry point. Also, 32-bit's um, kind of like the most compatible right now because say you do have an old PC laying around that has like XP, which is most likely 32-bit or earlier, um, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about can, you know, you can use that as like your little test bed for assembly. And one thing I do recommend is uh, possibly look into getting a virtual machine like Oracle VirtualBox, which is totally free. You can download it on the web and uh, then running like some stripped down version of an operating system inside of there so I could show you real quick one possible option here I'm gonna go ahead and go full screen with my virtual machine and so there is I can't believe I'm can't, okay react OS which is like sort of like a half-baked Windows clone of an operating system it's totally free you can see I'm gonna to go to reactos.org and uh, you can download it right here. Boom. It's like an ISO image, I think. And that will get you, you know, of course, you're a little bit on your own there. It's not too hard to do. I've done it many times before. So that should, you know, roughly speaking, that should give you the ballpark of a free, legitimately free Windows clone of an OS. If you have an old XP CD, an old Vista CD, an old Windows 2000 even, for the most part, everything I'm going to talk about should 99.99% .99 of it should apply to Windows 2000. So, um, and Windows 10 even, you know, Windows 10 is basically the glorified Windows 2000 under the hood, you know. Same thing with XP especially. So anyway, that's an operating system you can use if you need a free one and you don't want to worry about uh, patent and copyrights and stuff. And then the, uh, what is it, virtual box. So virtual box is put out for free, open source by Oracle. You can just go to virtualbox.org. And I would say you can get version six, even version five and probably even four and maybe even earlier if you really, for some reason, want to go earlier. But I personally prefer uh, VirtualBox 5. But anyway, uh, 6 should be just fine for anybody. Get this, install it, and then go in there, create a new virtual machine, maybe follow along with a tutorial, install React OS or an old XP CD or something. And that way, or even a new, you can even install Windows 10 inside of a virtual machine too. It doesn't really matter. The If you can go back 10 or so years on Windows, um, you know, try and get like Windows 7 or earlier, that's going to be more less resource intensive, I think. Especially, I don't know, I guess Windows 10, if you really, it just takes a lot more work on the, the newer the versions of Windows to go in and like turn off all the extraneous junk. So 
that's my thing and by doing this virtual machine in a virtual box like i said it's not necessary but if you destroy you know you're using assembly language this is like very low level language it's um 32-bit and 64-bit operating systems give you some protection around doing stupid stuff but when it comes down to it you know if you happen to have the right privileges or whatever you could accidentally write to a hard disk and just start you know that's how linux was created was linus torvalds accidentally dialed onto his hard drive instead of onto his modem and so he had um i believe it was like he had fully configured this operating system called minix which is kind of a cool little hobby os but that's about as far as it seems to go but um anyway he had custom compiled and like tuned this whole operating system and spent so much time getting it how he liked it and then he wrote this he was writing this little uh suite of uh program to basically like call bbs's or something like that and um of course you know he put in the wrong values in there and dialed his hard drive so that just effectively just wrote garbage onto his hard drive and his computer froze up and wouldn't reboot so he said hey you know what it took me so long to configure minix how i liked it and it wasn't even to my liking so that's when he went ahead and started creating linux and you know a year later everybody had hopped on board and was like hey this is you know seems to be something really cool and the rest is history right so anyway if you have a virtual machine that makes it virtually impossible to destroy your outside you know your host computer not that it's not possible i mean if you go out of your way more to like provide the connections between the two and allow that to happen more blatantly then you can still destroy your computer but if you run a windows compatible os inside of VirtualBox, you basically eliminate that problem so that's where i was getting out with all that so those are those and then what we need is masm i'm just going to punch that in and let the internet search kick in go back full screen here and we could see one of the first links that comes up is this Microsoft Macro Assembler package, which that's what I'm going to click on first. And what this is, is this is actually the Microsoft MASM 8.0 package, which is kind of middle of the road. It's from around 2005. And it it's the 32-bit one. All this is literally is just the standalone. I mean, it acts like it's a setup or whatever file. You know, it's supposed to be... Sounds like it's a package, right? It's only 300K. We hit download on it. We'll go ahead and save this file. MASM setup, 300K. So technically, this is MASM, but the thing is, it doesn't come with like a linker or the libraries and stuff that you'll probably, you know, all you can do is literally like assemble an object file, which is kind of cool to think about, but uh, we want to be able to do more than that. So there's MASM32, and so I punched in MASM32 into the search now, and you can see there's this MASM32site.com. You may have heard of it before. Now, what this is, is basically the MASM 6.14 or whatever, late 90s MASM version. Um, so, you know, closer to a decade older than that 8.0 one. But uh, it comes with a bunch of cool help files and a few little cool tools and stuff like that. So this is kind of like... I don't know. It's a little bit more eccentric of a package, but it reminds me of like that vibe of like Visual Basic 3 or QBasic or something like that where you sort of got the program and it was sort of this or Dev C++ if you remember that where it's this cool little like packaging of just the essentials and stuff. So we're going to get that and use that as our base. I'm just going to click on the downloads version 11 US site 1 should work. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and open it right here then. And you can see there's an install file, which is kind of funky. Um, what you can do, you see I've got it open in 7-zip, which is another program you can go search out on the internet and download. I highly recommend it. Um, 
what you could do is right click and say open inside and then you can see it's actually uh, they don't make it it's really ugly you know so you can't find like your actual program very easily and stuff like that so anyway you don't want to do that right click open inside so what it is it's an installer but there's really no reason for it to have an installer it's kind of dumb in that regard because all it does is create a link to this program called QEdit on your desktop but other than that it might as well just be a zip file so anyway that being said I'm just gonna run this installer it says warning you know I'm gonna go ahead and run it I've run it a hundred times before so it says uh, welcome to MS MASM 32 SDK installation so it's basically using that Microsoft um, MASM it's called the ML um, executable file for the assembler but all this extraneous packaging like the include files and all that is uh, that's sort of done by these people you can't really find it like it is anywhere else I mean you can find chunks and stuff but anyway you're preventing installing security so oh yeah so they tell you make sure and run this as administrator which is just a double down on like ridiculous but whatever it's kind of old it's stupid so I'm gonna select install onto the C drive uh, install will now try to determine if it can successfully build it uh, it appears okay read operation of the exe appears okay delete operation appears okay click extract to proceed so I just click through all that junk um, what you'll want to do is basically you could just unzip this exe file and then you can right click on it and select run as administrator or admin or whatever um, if you do have any problems with getting the permissions right and all that kind of stuff come on thing okay and then while that's processing over here okay there it goes so that's done I believe so we can close this the operation uses the console to build libraries. Ooh, maybe I shouldn't have closed that. Okay, just let it do its thing. Whenever stuff install programs open the console, if you start fiddling around with other stuff, it kind of shows that they're ghetto if they're open in the console usually. So I just like let the console sit at the top and just don't touch anything and let it go. So this is a good idea real time about how long it should take, I guess. And your computer might even run faster since I'm running in the virtual machine and my computer is not necessarily the fastest in the world to begin with. Unicode, ASCII. So that's one thing we're gonna differentiate between is um, ASCII and Unicode, or more specifically, it's referred to as like the ANSI functions in the Windows API library but I'll just call them ASCII because that's kind of what it is it's just referring more to the lower seven bits the lower 120 0 through 127 um, all that you know the American alphabet and numbers and all that kind of stuff so that's basically like the old 90s way of doing things so to speak and then in this century more it's the Unicode right and Unicode basically allows you to mix multiple languages and um, it also allows you to do some of the like fancier text you know you get a wide variety of text and stuff so Unicode is the preferred format most times but ASCII is sort of like if you're involved with American English PCs and stuff like that for the most part ASCII represents most of what you see anyway so um, to start out we'll start out with the ASCII functions Press any key to continue. Okay, which I just did. And then we'll touch into the Unicode stuff to kind of give an idea of that and what the trade-offs are. You know, that's increased complexity for dealing with most of the Unicode stuff, but um, it's not too far out of reach. Okay, so we got that package. And then what we can do is we can double check that it's all cool. The main system libraries appear to have built correctly, good. So these are uh, kernel 32, user 32, and GDI 32 are libraries that we'll often include when we're writing Windows programs. Um, a lot of times if you're using C or C++ or you know some high level language, those might automatically get included for you. But at the assembly level, we generally need to explicitly say, hey, we're going to use this. And so that's kind of a trade off with assembly or going low level, I should say. There are high level assemblers that will make it so that like 
it almost looks like you're programming in like basic or C or something like that because it's like if statements and comparison double equals comparisons and stuff like that but technically that's that's high level assembly language um i want to work more towards low level assembly language like yeah if you are writing production code in assembly sometimes it is better to write the high level stuff first and just sort of like hash out the jet the gist of what you're doing you know that like high level structure and then go in and uh fine tune it where it seems to matter most you know they say um test test first then tune so and in order to test you want to do the simplest thing that would work kind of thing first so that would probably be that and then then you profile your code in some manner and you determine like hey this little thing that's copying bytes of data from here to there is a bottleneck so then you can go in and zoom in on just that part in assembly first of all and then get dramatic results pretty quick and pretty easily okay Static libraries have been built successfully. Set shell. Um, so this is the thing that's actually going to create a little link in here to that editor. So I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead and do that. The installation is complete. Appears to run correctly. Now complete the following default editor for MS uh, version of ML Microsoft Assembler is over 10 years old and now you can say it's over 20 years old and while it is both reliable and stable it was written before the later SSC 234 instructions were available on Intel processors you need the latest instruction set you should obtain ml.exe from one of Microsoft's downloads usually Visual C or Visual Studio to have a version that has the later instructions available so uh, don't let that scare you those are ba it's basically saying the really advanced it's more advanced instructions that take advantage of the latest greatest kind of stuff aren't going to be available but for most everything i plan on covering at least initially this old masm6 thing should be fine but since we downloaded that 8.01 that should be really good you know that gets us to 2005 and 2005 was already, you know, that was the first generation of Microsoft's uh, Visual C and uh, MASM supporting 64-bit. And it also says they have like, you know, a solid decade or more of supporting the 32-bit. So it should be pretty good. It should have most everything we'll need in that MASM. I mean, even in the six, but in that eight, like I said. So anyway, it should pop this open if everything went well, and it will tell you some good stuff here that it's possible to download the old Win32 help file, which I'm glad it brought up because I want to address that. Um, so we'll just run through it. The MASM SDK has now been installed, but there are a number of things to do to finally set it up. Configure this editor so it suits your style. If possible, download the old Win32 help. So what we're going to go over here and do is now punch in Win API CHM because the one they're suggesting is an HLP help file and that was like Windows 3 and Windows 95 more. This CHM was like the Windows 95 plus. Um, it stands for like compiled HTML markup or something like that. Um, so this one right here is the one we want, this lawrencejackson.com win32. So this is exactly the file they're talking about, that help file but it is in chm format which is a little more modern it's still by today's standards it's actually a little outdated itself but at least it's a whole generation newer of a help file so when you get here oh there's a download link that's funny because i was searching this page and i was like hovering over everything earlier to uh try and download this and right here it gets a little confusing because they describe that like several people make it, attempts at this over the years but it wasn't until this person right here that got it mostly right. Um, but you, you'll you see there's this link, but there, there was like no link to it. So finally I thought, well, it's Win32 help. I'll just try punching in Win32CHM right here, um, like this, dot CHM. And that will work. If I hit enter, it says I'm gonna cancel it right now though. But it, that's what I did. <laughs> but anyway, if you can see, there's this download bubble right here that I just, neglected to see I must have just thought that was a logo or something click that that will let you download win32 save this file I'm gonna go ahead and go hit the up arrow 
until you know it's at the desktop and then I'm gonna hit my computer or that might just say like this computer or computer or whatever on other Windows versions and then I'm gonna go to local disk C double click that and if we go down here you can see MASM 32 is a folder your icons might look different but it should be in your C drive folder and go in there and you can see there's this help folder subfolder and I'm just gonna paste this right in here save you can do it wherever you want, do whatever you want, but that's just what I'm gonna do for now. So now that it's downloaded, I can click on my little download menu or you can open a file explorer and browse to your downloads folder. And I'm gonna click on this. And of course, running it straight out of Firefox or whatever browser you're using, it's probably gonna warn you, you know, this is executable off the internet. It's just saying that because it detected it's a downloaded file. So just say, okay. Um, here's a second security warning from uh, maybe this one's from Windows specifically I'm gonna say just go ahead and open it because I know what file I'm intending on opening and then I'm gonna maximize this so we can see here you can just start uh, hmm that's weird this was working in in the other windows if you have a newer version of Windows that that should be working let me try and open it one more time Okay, do not ask. Okay, there it goes. I just had to open it, close it, and reopen it apparently to get it to work on XP on newer systems. I think it just works right out of the box. But, um, and then I did uncheck, show me this warning next time. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But just fiddle with it. You should be able to get it going. So you can see it's using the CHM browser. And the cool thing is these little arrows you can just scroll through and you can literally like in the old one your only choices were to go to the index the search or to use these arrows and just haul butt through it so you got to figure this i think this is from the windows nt4 uh 1996 maybe late 1996 era i want to say so i think windows 95 windows nt4 but 99% plus or minus is going to apply to Windows 2000, Windows XP, even Windows Vista 7, 8, 10, all that stuff. Like, of course, you're not going to have like touch screen API in here, but it kind of it gives you the lowest common denominator, really. And it makes up the meat of what you'll want to do. Those other things, it's easier just to reference them right offline, you know, or right online, I guess I should say, where you just go and look up like the Windows Touch API online, which is different between the Windows operating systems that actually support it, which is like 7, 8, 8.1, and 10 to my knowledge. Um, I was trying to write some Touch stuff years ago, and I was just like amazed at how not user-friendly it was seeming to be. So, And now the trend is going away from touch screens. Um, I would say in about 2014, the trend was like, you know, 2013, 2014, the trend was really jumping towards touch screens. And it seemed like, oh no, I remember I got my laptop around that era and uh, my I got a cheapo, it was around 300 bucks. It's good, Toshiba still kicking butt. But um, anyway, it didn't have touch and I was bummed out about that at first and now I'm glad because it just, it, it's almost unnecessary for the desktop world okay anyway so you can go down in here and browse that's another thing it's way easier to just like random access browse into this um, this help for this stuff if you don't know what the Windows API is you're kind of like if you're gonna go into assembly language programming you really you have to take initiative on a lot of this stuff I'm gonna do what I can to explain it but I'm not gonna spoon feed too much because I don't want to take forever, which I do even if I stay on track with whatever my curriculum is. So uh, you just, you got to realize you're on your own with a lot of this stuff. Windows, the Win32 programmer's reference, for the most part, that means Win64 as well. And it means it so much that when they came out with 64-bit Windows, they went back and renamed, Microsoft went back and renamed all their Win32 stuff to just Windows. Um, that's one thing to note because what they were doing was they start calling it Win32 to differentiate it from Win16, which was like a retronym for uh, the 
the 16-bit like Windows 3.1 and all that era of stuff and DOS and all that kind of stuff. So Windows 32 basically represented the NT Windows, which 95 sort of copied. It was really like DOS under the hood, but Windows NT on the surface, more or less. And uh, of course, by Windows 2000, their goal was to converge and make it so that the Windows NT line of stuff was because Windows NT originally it was like if a program wasn't like really pure in a sense then it wouldn't run on Windows NT you know you had to have like that janky Windows 16 platform underneath it and uh, so they realized that there was so much legacy software that just wouldn't run on NT because it was so pure of a system and then by 2000 they imagined to like converge the two to where 2000 could run most of the essential software that might have some legacy code in it you know not pure nt kind of code and uh of course with windows xp which came out about a year later they um they really windows xp was kind of like if you remember the windows 95 and the windows 98 days this sort of a trend with microsoft is whenever they come out with a new system um a pivotal system it's the point one version of that that so to speak that really takes off so like windows 95 came out and that was the big mainstream game changer for like the home desktop but then it was then all of a sudden they switched the narrative to like oh windows 98 and added a bunch of fluff in 98 and stuff and acted like 95 didn't exist same thing happened with windows 2000 that came out that was the big pivotal nt 5.0 uh shift in operating systems and then a year later windows xp comes out and then they act like oh 2000 never existed <laughs> you know but whatever um so of course the windows 9x line was windows 95 98 and millennium edition millennium had the 9x under the hood a lot like windows 98 second edition under the hood but it um had the windows 2000 sort of looking user interface with the newer icons a little bit better of a look to it and surprisingly if you remember the early 2000s the late 1990s um we were anybody who like was maybe like a computer technician kind of person or whatever we were all using windows 98 se that was like the best of the windows 99 x generation for the most part but one thing i noticed is because because i kept using windows millennium i switched to linux and then i left windows millennium installed on a partition until after 2005 i would say till like 2008 ish or something i mean i was a major holdout on it of course because by 05 like 9x was like really going out quick um but anyway millennium edition for the 9x series actually it was kind of considered a joke in the beginning you know but by the end of it that one was the most robust out of the 9x series i don't think a lot of people held out as long as i did maybe to realize that so i just wanted to share that but going back um I think more obviously the 9x series was based on a lot of 16-bit thunking and dossy kind of style stuff so it was really prone to crashes and instabilities and stuff like that windows 2000 was what was up if you have an old computer you know somewhere that has like windows 9x on it um if it has i want to say uh i guess you'd have to say maybe if it has 64 or more megabytes of memory for sure 128 bytes or or megabytes excuse me of memory it will run windows 2000 just fine i want to say even on 64 megabytes it's better than dealing with like the crash and burns of the windows 9x series and you'll get you'll be able to run a lot newer software um all that kind of stuff you know you're sort of like getting towards more of that windows xp kind of territory for the architecture uh, but yeah, anyway, that's enough of that whole nostalgia trip, I guess. So this is the reference. This is the Windows API. Windows exposes a C library that is basically just about everything you can imagine doing with Windows um, is going to be part of the, you know, if you want to display like these tabs right here, you know, that's a combination of Windows API calls. If you want to, uh, you know, do something in the command prompt, you can do that with Windows API calls. Of course, you can, inside of the command prompt, you can fall back to the uh, 
the standard C libraries. So you can use printf or put, which is short for print string, printf is short for print formatted. Um, you can use those regular standard C calls that will, they're multi-platform, don't forget. You know, a lot of people have veered away from that stuff and said like, oh, those are unsafe. They don't handle Unicode, da 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 They're easy, keep it simple. You know what I mean? Do your first implementation with stuff like that. And then if need be, go and do like a more secure or wide string version or a more platform specific version or whatever, stuff like that, right? But, and that's what I'm trying to like, I feel like I've kind of found a little bit of a happy medium after trying to uh, get my own feet wet many times over the years with this kind of stuff and going to it and then going away from it and then going back to it. So this will tell you all about Windows. A lot of this is still verbatim in the newer Windows documentation. I mean, just you can tell that it's just an edited version of this. And this same stuff, all, I mean, don't be discouraged by this old looking window. You know, as you can see, I'm kind of using those with in XP right now. Um, it still applies even if it's fancier and bubblier or square or whatever looking now you still have an X button you still have a maximize button you still have a minimize button you still have an application icon you still have that traditional menu if it's not there hit the alt key and it will appear you know so like if I go over here um, I can get rid of this one say don't show me now I'm gonna press alt the left alt key and there it appears you know and disappears so that's how you can get that menu if you need it um this talks about everything and so when it comes down here like main window creation so you can see right here this in c just represents a numeric value and that's in the windows header files or the windows include files those are all set to some you know this might be error already exists and then it will say like negative one and it's like a defined statement or something so what we need to do an assembly is we don't necessarily have to include all those C header files and I personally most times choose not to you can to some degree but um, it's easier just to go dig in and look up what is if this is a negative one then just set this to a negative one in your assembly file since you're only going to use this probably for you know a very few of these and that way it kind of like it's sort of educational too because you get to go in and peek under the hood and look, go okay this is what's really going on you know so we're going low level and we're just gonna keep it clean keep it simple but not be scared of going low level at the same time use caution but a lot of this stuff they try and detract you from going low level and you know if you're not used to programming in C which is becoming I would think a little bit less common these days um i still think it's just as relevant to program in c but you're that this will look for and even if you have programmed in c years ago this will still look scary compared to like python and stuff like that and javascript right very similar syntax to javascript but this is sort of the windows way of uh program let me see if i can get down to like some actual functions api reference down here so you can search this like this too so i can go write console and this is sort of like I don't even want to say this is like printf. This is like what printf would use to implement its functionality or puts, put string would use to implement. So you can go to quick info here and this shows you, um, you know, most of this top stuff isn't really relevant except back in the mid nineties because you'd want to know, does this also work on, you know, if it's permission based, it's only going to work on windows NT windows NT is you whatever you're using right now unless you're using like the oldest computer known you know but if you're using a computer from any time in this century it your windows nt is what you're using so know that um windows 95 that's the windows 4 series so windows 32 s was the windows 16 windows 3.1 which was kind of funny the irony that Windows 3.1 and then the next major version of Windows was Windows 3.2, Windows 32, but that wasn't a direct, to my knowledge, that wasn't intended. That was just like one of those unattended things. Um, and then you can see kernel32.lib, so it's important to note that library because that is, you'll need to include that library somehow, some way. Um, this header file, if that might be relevant to you but we're going to try and stay away from that so but what you care about is that um all this stuff's gonna I, I haven't found anything that doesn't work in windows nt that i'm maybe something but 
for the most part, anything you're going to look into is going to work on Windows NT, and you just want to take note of the import library. And then right here is the function, and it's just, you know, don't get scared of the syntax or nothing. It's saying all these capitals are just Windows types, so to speak. Um, under the hood, they're really just like, the vast majority of the time, they're just D words. So a lot of times in our code, we'll just say, hey, this is a D word and forget about it. Because in assembly language, you basically deal with bytes, um, words, which is like a double byte, and then a D word, which is a double word, which is like a double, double byte. So it's like four bytes, 32 bits, because there's eight bits in a byte, eight times four is 32. So that's why in a 32 bit platform, we mostly end up with D words. And that's one of the things that makes a lot of stuff really easy. And even if you have something that's bigger than you're like, whoa, I've got a whole sentence that's made up of lots of bytes um, as a string or something. How can I possibly send that as a parameter as a 32 bit D word? Well, you send a pointer, right? You send a 32 bit address to whatever it is. Um, with Windows specifically, another reason to be using Windows right now is because it uses the long, long, type of 64-bit architecture, what do they call it, the LLP, long, long, and pointers. And so there's like ILP, LLP, you might hear of. And so um, in 64-bit windows even, they use the long, long, and pointers are 64 bits. So that means even if you are writing a 64-bit assembly, or I should say a C program, and you ask for a long value it's still going to be 32 bits but on virtually every other 64-bit platform i know of um that would you would actually by asking for a long value you get a 64-bit so windows just did that primarily because they realized that hey most times you know two two to four gigabytes or whatever for people is gonna be for the vast majority of stuff plenty way more than plenty right so if they really want that 64-bit value, then they can request a long, long. Um, I want to say that was C99 when that was introduced. That was one of those features that it's like, I don't know. I think it kind of makes sense on one hand. So anyway, for right console, it's going to return a true or false, like a zero or one kind of value. A handle that's going to be a 32-bit D word, which is just a like a license plate number to um, to the console. So. If I were to open this, it's gonna have some handle value. I guess I don't really have Process Explorer installed on here, or do I? Proc, I'm not seeing it. So I don't know if the task manager, let's see here, applications, um, task manager, it can probably have a handle in here. IO threads. I'm not seeing it, but there's ways to get in and look at everything has a handle in Windows. It's just like it's literally like a temporary serial number for that existence of that thing. So this one would be like 00105034321 or something. And it's just like basically a random number that gets assigned to it, so to speak. And that's how you can refer to this console window. That's how you can differentiate that console window from this one. You know what I mean? And all that kind of stuff. So when you pass stuff to these Windows functions back here, what they're getting is this is just a function in Windows. It doesn't know necessarily what console are you talking about. You might be calling this from this program. You might call you know, from your browser that you wrote or edited or whatever, you might call write console, but then you have two consoles open and it's like, well, which console do you want me to write to? So you send it a handle, but you're like, whoa, how do I know what the handle to that console is? Good question. So you go in here and you say, get standard handle. And this is what you'd have to do. You'd have to come over here and run this function, which you can see returns a handle, and you tell it whether you want the input handle or the output handle or the error handle, standard in, standard out, or standard error handle. And oh, I think this is like negative 10, negative 11, and negative 12. I don't remember. The newer API documentation, like you can look this up on the web, and that will give you 
Um, and I don't expect you, you're not expected to know these things right off the bat. The way that I knew Get Standard Handle would do that, sorry to kind of jump around a little bit. So I'm back to right console, and we could see right here, it describes each one of those parameters. This is like the short, this is basically like, you know, a declaration kind of a block. And then this right here explains them in a little bit more detail. Identifies the console screen buffer to be written. The handle must have generic write access. And then you get down here, it tells you the return values, if the function succeeds, if you care or not. Um, and then the remarks sometimes right here, I don't, right now I don't think it's a big problem to need to read this, but the remarks will tell you any additional info. But uh, we basically we can see we need to handle the console output so then we start looking at we can go over here to group up here and then you can see here's all the related console functions so these most likely what we need any dependent functions kind of like functionality is going to be in here so we can if we scroll through here you know you can see it's just a page or two we can scroll down we see okay here's get standard handle or you can maybe do a control f and then search for h a n d l e and we can see there's a a few handle routines so i can just there's one to set the handle, there's one to control, there's one to get. So git sounds like the one, you'd go in there, click on that and read right here. And it says the git handle, standard handle function returns a handle for the standard input, standard output, standard error device. So that's basically the kind of routine you gotta do to figure out which functions need what, you know. Um, this was just before object oriented programming got really popular. Um, the cool thing is, is this has stayed around. The object-oriented programming implementations, excuse me, have come and gone. But this, I knew it in the 90s, in the mid-90s when I started using it, and I realized like, hey, even though everybody was going towards a thing called MFC, Microsoft Foundation Classes, they were just big and bloated and slow on my little 486 computer with like probably eight megs of RAM or 12 megs of RAM or something. It, um, it just like MFC programs, they were like kind of pretty, you know, like I guess you could say this could be like an MFC type of a thing, where it's just sort of like prefab stuff that like prefabricated stuff that's a little bit more than the most generic. Well, with the Windows API, you're going mostly really generic and you got to build your own stuff up, but you can build up your own objects in your own language, or there are even cross platform libraries that will tie into the Windows API as necessary or whatever. Um, but the good news is we're not going to use any of this crap today that I'm talking about. This is too low level. Um, I originally did a thing with this. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm going to close this out. That might be a little bit. So that's the wind help thing. That's addressing that. Uh, equates directly. If you're not already familiar with the MASM32 SDK, you start with the default editor, which is what I'm in. It's not a big deal. You can use Notepad. You can use Visual Studio Code. You can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You, but the simpler, the better. You know, you just want a plain text editor. Maybe with syntax highlighting is all I prefer. Uh, you can see the Intel Pentium 4 later manuals can be handy. I'm not even going to use those. I'm just going to use the Intel 3D6 manual, which reminds me, I want to point those out. Um, right here, you can get this at this address. It's at MIT, CSAIL, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Labs. Uh, if you just search for, uh, what, MIT 380, I386 PDF, uh, whatever programmer manual reference manual something like that it should come up or just write and take note of this uh, this address right here and go there it's CSS CSAIL MIT EDU 6.858 slash 2015 slash reading slash i386 dot PDF as you can see this is you know 421 pages right 1986 this is the core 32-bit PC manual it might sound old or whatever but this is this is it for a lot of it you know this is especially for any introduction to 32-bit assembly like you don't want to honestly mess with much more than this to begin with um, I just really like I think somebody's gone in and like freshed up this manual because what I remember is there was a text one that used to float around and then there was a PDF one that was like rugged looking 
grainy looking scanned pages but I don't remember this one this is like cleaned up really nicely and uh, you know you can see all the text is really square nice italicized fonts and you can hover over it and click into something like instruction set and then up here you might want to say uh, page width to get that and then you know it's just it's beautiful really um, and you can come in here and this is going to tell you everything I mean the more you want to read of this just for yourself page for page the merrier um, at some point after it explains segmentation selection stuff like that a lot of that's going to apply to 16-bit, uh, which you can ignore. You care more about the EAX, EBX, ECX, whatever with the E prefix register kind of stuff. That's what we're mostly concerned with. All this stuff with just the two, that's going to be 16-bit. And this stuff with the H or the L, that's 8-bit. Um, we will use stuff like AL occasionally to refer to just one byte in the EAX register, right? So if we just want to refer to that one specific 8-bit byte in that register, we'll refer to AOL. If we want to refer to one 16-bit word, we'll refer to AX, you know. So that's a, for the most part, that's as far as you need to know into those. Maybe occasionally with the other ones too. Um, but yeah, this... Oh, some of this, I mean, if it seems like 16-bit segment offset junk ignore that for now i mean that's interesting to get back into but that was complexities because you were limited to like 64 kilobit kilobyte windows back in the day with the 16-bit programming because that's you know 65 535 zero through that right was all that you could address with 16 bits um directly so you were limited to those like address ranges so you had to create a bunch of those address ranges and manage them and it was a bunch of extra overhead to do but nowadays you don't have to do that and our programs are going to be so small that even if we were 16 bits we could get away with just a flat com file anyway where the data and instruction segments are this or yeah are the same sorry i'm trying to just go over as much of this as possible um thanks for bearing with me if you have this far so this is the intel 8386 programmers reference manual 1986 get it in whatever form you can save that to that MASM32 folder in the help folder or somewhere where you'll remember it and have easy quick access to it. I'd recommend in that same MASM32 slash help folder. And uh, then you know, like you could just open that with your Explorer and go straight there. And um, you can probably just use your web browser to look at it, or you can download a third party PDF viewer like Sumatra PDF this is a good free one. Um, I don't like the Adobe brand stuff because it integrates too much and it just gets creepy. You know what I mean? So I just, I like, I use Sumatra or the browser. Um, this is another one that's kind of, you know, there, of course there's lots and lots of stuff that I could expand on right now, but I don't want to overwhelm, but I want to point you to some specifics that, you know, if not today, tomorrow, this will come in big time handy. This is Agner Fogg's optimizing assembly. This is, uh, a lot of people talk about this. You can see he started it in, I'm assuming it's a guy, I started it in 1996 and is still in 2020 to this day, you know, so basically across most of the lifetime, as far as we care of Windows 32 and Windows 64 as well, he's been uh, keeping this going. Excellent optimization tutorial and it's not really even just optimizations it's like gotchas and stuff like that of you know it's only about 150 pages um even if you get one of the older versions i would say if it's like 2015 or later whatever but if you go to agner.org you can get this latest one you could see uh operating systems covered by this manual 16-bit dos and windows 3 32-bit Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Intel, Mac OS X, 64-bit Windows, Linux, BSD, Mac OS X. Like, it really covers a lot. It is so excellent. And if you're anything like me, any kind of geek like me, maybe with a little bit of assembly experience and whatnot already, you start reading this thing, you're not going to be able to put it down. I mean, it's just like 
you're just like, whoa, whoa, it's all this key stuff. And it's the little reminders about like when you clear the stack, like don't forget to like pop these registers before you do this. Just all the little things that people say, oh, you shouldn't use assembly because you're going to run into those little weird problems and you know, that are take forever to debug and da da da. This talks about all those, <laughs> like for the most part. And it even discusses some assemblers um, right here. Which MASM, of course, is the style we're using. If you come down here, GAS is going to be the GNU Linux. That's going to be more of the like Unix type of assembler. So that's Mac and Linux and BSD most specifically. It uses the AT&T syntax where the source and destination operands are uh, flipped. So that's, I mean, there's some trade-offs. It's considered more compiler friendly, like because... Uh, the GNU and Clang compilers produce intermediate assembly by default, as far as I know. They might not produce the file, but they internally produce assembly instead of going straight to machine languages. As far as I know, the uh, Microsoft compilers I th and so a lot of other ones, I think they go straight to machine language. Even though a lot of them will have the option to produce intermediate assembly, I don't think that's necessarily a step that they go through, but from what I understand, that is a step that the uh, GNU and CLang stuff do. So anyway, that's something to note there. And that this the way it's worded too, what it covers about all this, I basically am just rehashing in my own words. Um, NASM, this is one I would like to get to. Oh, and US, UASM. These are the only two others that I really care about for this little series that I plan on doing is, or excuse me, not FASM, UASM and NASM. Um, I like all these other ones too. They all have their, their ups and downs. You know, FASM is really cool. There's a bunch of like tutorials and documentation and editors that come along with that package. If you got the time and space on your hard drive, whatever, install them all and go in and dink with them all, who cares? But uh, overall from, you know, the middle of the road, you know, least common denominators, best overall perspective kind of thing. NASM is one. Um, like they say, it's currently the best multi-platform assembler widely used by assembly programmers. It's still kept up to date. It basically, I want to say it's older now. I remember when NASM was like the, the free x86 com, uh, assembler, you know, when all the main other options were like TASM and it, the name brand MASM. But, uh, Anyway, that one uses a little bit different. It's a little bit more of a cleaned up, concise syntax than MASM. Um, so that's really cool. And then here's UASM. And this one's based off of the Wacom one, which is based off of MASM itself. So what you have is Wacom, if you're not familiar with that, that was, I loved it. I, I guess it's not really supported much anymore, but it doesn't even really need to be. Um, I don't know, I don't remember whether or not it has 64-bit support and to what extent, but I'll tell you what, for 16 and 32-bit support, I gotta say I'm always uh, pleasantly uh, surprised or happy or whatever whenever I am reminded about the Wacom compiler suite because it's just... I'll forget about it. I'll think like, oh, GCC and MSVC and stuff like that. But I'll forget about Wacom or even Borland will come to mind before them. But Wacom just was just badass. It was so concise and like offered you so many command line switches. I think in a lot of ways, it just hasn't been beat to this day. But this being that being said, this is just it had like an MASM kind of clone in it. Um, which came out into the projects JWASM and HJWASM were ones that improved on it. And then UASM is like the newest improvement, I guess, on all of that. So this is basically, I don't know if you want to think of it as like universal MASM or uh, whatever. This, to my current knowledge, this is your best bet for a modern MASM compatible compiler. Even at the high level, it can handle the MASM syntax and stuff. So uh, all these other ones, I don't plan on covering very much in this series. They tell you which one to choose. Oh, floating point registers. There's just so much like, just at least skimming through this. Um, addressing modes. Even talks I think about like, 
Let's go back up to that. Reasons for using, reasons for not using assembly, intrinsic functions in C++, MASM inline assembly. I don't know. Go through it. Have fun. It's it's rad. Um, okay, and then the one from AMD. AMD offers a bunch of technical documents, so if you do want to get into the more modern, um, I'm an AMD fanboy kind of thing, so there's a developer.amd.com. Um, let's see here, if I just say like, devel, dev AMD manuals. I spell manuals wrong. But let's see, here it is. It's uh, developer.amd.com slash resources slash developer dash guides dash manuals. If we go or just type dev AMD manuals and it should be pretty much the first result. I'm gonna click on that. For some reason, internet's running a little bit slower than usual. Um, and then it, when you come in here, if you scroll down a ways, you'll eventually see this AMD 64 architecture. And this goes all the way back to uh, at least to the 32-bit. It may even have some 16-bit stuff in it too. Um, but they just call it AMD 64. So what it's saying, and when you think of like x86-64, that standard was not produced by Intel. Intel did the IA64, which is a different, not backwardly compatible kind of standard. So anyway, in a nutshell, the story is that AMD beat Intel to the punch of producing an x86 backward compatible 64-bit architecture and if you're using a 64-bit PC Windows PC you know it is um, the AMD 64 there is no Intel 64-bit architecture that we care about anymore um, there was an old one during the XP era and if you care about that you know where to find those manuals or <laughs> you can figure it out but so don't think that this means like not Intel. This this means Intel just as much. Intel, they did this cross license agreement with each other to where they agreed to share like AMD shared all their 3D now and all that kind of specs openly with Intel under a clause that says basically that they can do whatever they want with it. And Intel did the same with them with the SSE and MMX kind of stuff. And so now they can interchangeably use that and they did that so that both could utilize the others the best of the others technologies without worrying about patent patent encumber encumbrance or anything like that um so anyway if you this first one is all the manuals thousands of pages of manuals in one but I'd probably recommend, unless you have a supercomputer and like searching through one huge PDF, get these one, two, three, four, five, six individually, as well as these other two uh, sort of appendices. Um, the main ones that matter, of course, at least, is volume one app programming and volume three general purpose and system instructions. Those would be, if you want to just get the bare minimum, grab those two. Um, system programming is more for if you're writing operating systems or if you're writing really low level tools, uh, drivers, things like that. And then there's this optimization guide, which is specifically what I wanted to point out today as not to forget. And so I'm going to close this out and you can click through on those. They're just PDFs and then you can download them. Um, is a software optimization guide kind of you know similar to the Agner fog thing and like I said don't be discouraged that it says software optimization guide for six AMD 64 processors and then it shows these cool logos and stuff this applies to you know basically that Intel 386 all the way through the processors that come out tomorrow kind of thing you know for as far as that so-called x86 lineage you can see like 32-bit internal data types. You use 32-bit integers instead of integers with smaller sizes. Um, this optimization applies to 32-bit software. Be aware of the amount of storage associated with each. So they're just throwing out uh, recommendations. Like you use a 32-bit integer, then maybe there's less hassle to do with uh, what, you know, even though 16 bit seems like, oh, that's going to take up less memory or whatever, it still is going to hog a 32 bit uh, register, right? You can't use, if you're only using the AX portion of the EAX or the RAX register, um, the E and the R mean like E means the 30, the full 32 bits of the register. I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit. 
But anyway, it just has stuff like that, like, you know, little... These aren't even the best examples. There were some good ones when I came through here earlier. Most of it's going to apply for 32-bit software. Um, a lot of it will apply for both 32-bit and 64-bit software. But you can just skim through this, and the more you go through and write assembly language programs, the more you'll kind of want to reference this. Um, it's only, you know, anything less than 400, about 400 pages or less, I consider, especially if it's two to 300 pages, like, that's really ideal, right? You know, but definitely under 500 pages is, uh, those are the kind of documents I like to kind of focus on that, you know, they're leaning a little bit less complex. If they're pushing 500 pages and they have a huge reference in them, like, you know, an instruction set reference, then it's like, okay, whatever, I can understand that reference alone could take hundreds of pages. But um, as far as like explanations, I don't like more than a couple hundred pages worth of explanations in any of my text. Otherwise, that probably belongs in another volume. Okay, so those are those. On one last quick mention of them the software optimization guide store that for the future agner fog get this for the now optimizing subroutines and just dive into it occasionally that's what i'm doing right now as i'm refreshing and upgrading my skills um it's just got tons of good tips like oh yeah you know that kind of a thing and then this 386 use this as probably your primary go-to for just instead of those uh, amd the one through five guides I just went over skip those for now and just focus on 32 bit. I've already tried to dive into 64 bit, um, about two years ago. Exactly. Coincidentally, ironically, whatever, um, I was trying to do, I was going to go and just do an AMD 64 thing and I was going to use MASM, whatever, and just do 64 bit programming and skip the whole 32 bit thing. And then maybe go back to 32 bit. But now coming and revisiting this again, I've realized, you know what, it really is better to do this 32 bit intro, um, introduction and get, you know, reasonably solid feel for this before going to 64 or back to 16 or I would say 8-bit, but before jumping, before doing 16 or 64-bit, I would definitely recommend doing this 32-bit stuff. 8-bit, um, you could probably just go to that one if you really want a really much more basic version, but the 8-bit isn't going to line up with the modern way as much. In the most simplest abstract form it does, you get a few registers, you know, and like an accumulator and stuff like that, and you have memory that you're addressing and you know then you have these mov and add instructions and stuff like that so on that level it's that all that's going to definitely apply but anyway okay back over to here so we're there and what else did I want to point out so I want to do a quick like hello world program and stuff of course before and to do that I'm going to close out all this junk for now And let's go back full screen with this one. And one thing you can do too, it's a little buggy sometimes on mine. I don't know if I'll crash things out, but if I, you can also do this, uh, what is it called? Seamless mode, host L, which is the right control key on, by default on a PC. So with this, then it gives you two of these uh, start bars here. It gives you one for XP and one for your original <laughs> operating system, which is kind of cool. But I used to use this almost exclusively back in the day, but I just noticed that like every other version of virtual box or whatever, it just like seems to jank out and I run into problems or whatever. But that's an option. So if you want everything to look like it's just basically on the, you know, the same computer but you just sort of pick which shell you want to use and that was a uh, right control key and L to get in and out of that but to keep it stable I pretty much just use um, this view which is uh, the maximized I guess auto adjusted maximized one and or I hit right control and F to go to just plain old full screen if I want to get in that mode okay so the thing I guess the one of the better ones is called it's by Jeff Wang 
see if it takes it right to us. Uh, computer science at Brown University. There he is. He did a pretty good thing. I don't know if it's... Okay, so I'm going to just go back and I'm going to do Jeff Wang. And then I'm going to say uh, your first program. Because that's the title of the chapter that we want. Oh, Jeff Wang. Maybe we'll do uh, X86 PDF. All right. No. Okay, this one's at, I'm doing the second one at jeffwang.com to see if this is it. Webgazer, IJCAI, whatever, seven pages. This sounds like about it. No, it's not. Oh, man, why can't I find this? What is it called? Windows Assembly Programming Tutorial. Jeff? It's called Windows Assembly PDF. Okay, either one of these looks like they... That one's from December of 2003, if you look at the bottom of my screen there. Um, that, I don't know if that's the same one. Let's see what this one is. They must all be. Okay, I'll just click on it. I guess, like I said, you know, it seems like, oh, that's too old. But you know what? By 2003, most everything that we're going to care about for most of our programs was already invented and in wide use. Okay, that first one took seemed to be a little bit dud. I'm going to go to the second one. Go to file, I guess I have to click. Oh, come on. This was easy to find before. Windows Assembly Programming Tutorial. Usually I don't have to type everything out this detailed. Win ASM Tut. That is the right file name for sure. So that's what we want to get here. And then if you want, just click your download in whatever browser you're using. See, I use Sumatra PDF as my viewer, but I'm just going to click Save File. And then we'll go to my computer, C, MASM32 into that help folder. And then we'll just, when ASM to it, we'll just dump it in there with everything else. Okay, so when you start going through here, it's short, 17 page. I think it's like maybe a sample of a book or I don't know. It's book quality, it seems like. It just kind of talks about like, oh, you know, why would you want to use ASM? What are some of the popular compilers? All the same stuff you're used to. Um, here's a really good starting example. This is what a lot of people will show you when uh, you first want to get into like assembly language programming under Windows, they're going to do this. So let's go here and uh, shrink this down and open up that little Q editor and be cool like them. Where to go? Right here. I'll paste it in there. Get rid of that extraneous space. Okay. Um, it's a bunch of extra spaces on the end of these lines. I don't know if that matters. I'm just going to get rid of them. But anyway, there's I have a lot of problems with this code. So for one thing, what it's doing is it's using invoke. Can I make this uh, bigger tools code conversion script? You know what? I just want to show how if you copy and paste from a PDF file, just be careful because, um, you know, sometimes it might use the wrong kind of quotes or stuff like that. You know what I mean? So just open it, print it, notepad. If you see any weird characters, delete them. Delete any extraneous spaces. Good, it's using spaces instead of tabs. That's cool. So I'm going to come up here. I'm just going to add some basic stuff. Okay, case map usually is like that. That's usually like that. That's something more like that. Okay, so this first one's pretty much required to my knowledge. Um, I haven't, I mean, I did refresh myself over the last couple few days on some MASM stuff, but I haven't used that at all in depth in a couple years. And even then my knowledge is extremely limited. So 
please bear with me in that regard but I'm doing the best I can with what I've got and so this is a 386 directive which unlocks up to the 386 processor instruction set and I believe that also includes the uh, 8087 uh, math coprocessor you might think of as like floating point unit kind of a thing so back in the day that was until you got to the 486 and arguably even then so um, the floating point coprocessor was an optional thing and most programs especially back then didn't use floating point instructions most of the time so it wasn't a big deal and you could emulate all the stuff you do with floating point so if you did need one-off functionality of floating point you could just download or make your own routines or whatever and accomplish that you know what they call like a floating point emulator to the point even Linux can run at least the old ones I think now they've probably removed it but you know, before they removed the actual i386 support out of Linux so many years ago, um, like to where you could literally run it on an old, like dust off an old 386 and run it on there, it could even emulate the floating point instructions. So that's how non critical that was. But there were, you know, so the 386SX was like how they said the 386 without the floating point, and then the DX was the one that included, you know, that meant you had the floating point processor installed. Anyway, don't worry about that too much. That's what became evolved into like MMX and SSE and all that kind of stuff nowadays. That's all the floating point processor involved, evolved. Okay, so 386, this could be like 686, you know? If you wanted to do something that was like a Pentium Pro, Pentium 2 instruction specifically, you could do 686. Um, but we're just gonna stick to 386. The, for now you know but if you ever are wondering about that like oh I really want to do like this MMX thing or something or actually to do MMX you would even come down here and do like a dot MMX like that to, so that's what those top directives do is they unlock that instruction set so we're basically unlocking up to the 386 and then this next one down model flat this was more and then the standard call um this was more important back in the 16-bit era because then you had to decide like you had a handful of different models that you could do but in 386 especially application programs you're going to be flat so it's that's just like boilerplate pretty much standard call is optional we could get rid of that comma standard call but what that's saying is if we do call some function outside of our assembly language program you know probably a C function or whatever it's going to use the standard call calling convention which I'm pretty sure um, I only did a quick review on those but the standard call I think is pretty much the C calling convention but the caller cleans the stack um, instead of the half and half where the I think in the standard C calling convention the uh, the caller cleans the stack did I say that and then standard call, the call E, the, the function getting called cleans the stack. Anyway, don't take my word for it. Look it up on your own. Um, both of them push the parameters onto the stack from right to left if you're looking at the C code, how they'd be written. And then a lot of people include this option case map none, which just, to my knowledge, just leaves everything cased, upper or lower cased, exactly how you have it. Um, if you don't have that option in there, which I'm going to get rid of, then it will convert everything behind the scenes when you go to assemble it. It will convert everything to uppercase letters, except, of course, like your strings and stuff and um, any external function stuff. I think it will leave case sensitive. But I don't know. I'm just getting rid of it now because it's just extra complexity. Then here's a bunch of include files that a lot of them aren't even necessary for this program in my opinion um but these are when i was saying you know the kernel 32 so right here i'll put a little space so it helps make it a little more distinguishable so these are ink files they're equivalent of like a dot h header file and if you think of like the windows api and c and maybe c plus plus programming um that that's what these are equivalent of but they're a little bit more cleaned up for assembly programming because the C ones have like extra junk that MASM doesn't understand. So these ones have been uh, reasonably cleaned up so that like it's just 
the the main stuff you know just like the function declarations and the uh those capital letter types like a handle being a d word and stuff so if you ever want to know what that stuff is you can go in to your masm folder 32 folder here and go into this include and then we can go into like windows oh that's kind of a go right here go into windows details i'll scroll down here and find the windows where are you at Windows Inc. right here, right? And I'm going to double click on that and it knows to open it in Notepad. That's cool. Maximize that. And so maybe if my font's big enough, let's see if we can make the font a little bit bigger. It's 18 too big. We'll go 12. Yeah, there's a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, shoot, I'll just go with 18 format. As long as this fits with no bottom scroll bar, nice. So this you can see it's Windows Inc. for 32-bit released January 2012. So that tells you right there, you know, they've been kicking this little uh SDK package around these hacker guys or whatever since uh 20, you know, up through 2012. This version is compatible with ML version 8 or later. Huh. That's funny because MASM32 does not come with ML. 32 8 or later let's go even take a look at that here um, I'll go ahead and bump up this size here and say properties what we got for font do one bigger two bigger okay oh bigger yeah that one maybe looks like okay I'm gonna CD backslash CD MASM 32 oops and then do a dir forward slash w here so ah uh, such a tacky looking directory listing what was i even looking for oh the masm version so if we go into the bin folder which you may want to add to your path and you can do that by just saying path equals uh c masm 32 bin and then a semicolon and then percent path percent like that and then if we type path, we can see now that MASM deal is right there at the beginning. So we'll search that path, that path first. So then when we type ML slash question mark, make this a little bigger, then we can see up here it's a 6.14.8444. So it's 6.14 is uh, what version this is. It isn't the 8.01, but those ink files still seem to work with it, which is fine. All right, and uh, that reminds me of the other thing I meant to do too. When I downloaded that, what was it in downloads? So this MASM setup.exe file, the, the very first thing we downloaded, I'm going to right click on that. You'll want to go and download and install 7-zip or something compatible. I recommend that, of course. And go to, you'll right click on the file after 7-zip's installed and go to open as an archive right here, open archive. And then that will take you to the setup.exe file. And then we're going to right click and open inside on that. And then this is much easier than that MASM installer file to dig through. And then what we can see here is we have the, the Microsoft installer thing. And then we got a cab. So we're going to right click on the cab and say open inside. And then you can see MLEXE. So what that installer basically does is just copies this to your Visual Studio directory and uh, renames it to ML.exe. So what we're going to do is click on that file and hit extract. Hit this triple dot ellipsis thing to... Uh, come over here and browse and we'll go my computer C drive MASM 32 we're expanding all those go in here to bin okay so you have C MASM 32 slash bin and we're gonna extract it into there okay close out all this junk and then I'm gonna browse back to that MASM bin folder and what we'll do is go find that original ML file right here so this is that ml6 file right so i'm going to rename this to ml-6.114 
since we looked at it we know that's what it is now I'm gonna go find that really weird looking one did it even extract it to here oh I might have just done it to not bin okay I don't remember where I extracted it so I'm gonna find that again um, that was in downloads right click on it open archive right click open inside right click open inside again extract this I'm gonna hit down the down arrow one time now we can see CMASM32 bin okay it's in there already so it's a capital FL is what I was looking for I guess close all those out um, so if I go back into the bin folder now I'm just gonna pit this on this uh, details a little bit easier for me to go through and it's organized by name so come down here FL okay there it is so I'm gonna slow double click on that right you click on it once wait a second and then click on it again to rename and then delete all that junk and just name it, name it ml.exe enter okay and if you don't have your file extension showing you might want to rename that in quotes like let's see if it'll let us do that quote ml.exe quote oh it's not letting us do the quotes but I know that's one way around it if you can't in some situations like at the command prompt you can also go to view tools folders options it will look different in newer versions of Windows but similar idea and you come in here and you'll say uh, under this view tab all these like uh, display full path and address bars nice display full path and title bar and uncheck this hide extensions for known types right there uncheck that and then hit apply um, that way you can make sure and see your extensions because you're a big bad assembly language programmer so now we can see just by hovering over it this one has a lot more metadata than that old one even did the old one doesn't even act like if we hover over that or right click and go to properties even it doesn't even know anything about itself really it just knows like hardly anything but if we go to our new one our 8.0 one we downloaded go to properties we can see it has all this information filled in you know it's 8.00 da 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 from uh, Visual Studio 2005 instead of the 1996 or 98 SDK or whatever um, so yeah so now that gets us up to that 8.0 ML not a big deal that probably doesn't even matter but just to make you feel better about being in this century with things um, I recommend the Windows SDK 7.1 that is what I recommend for anything like down that's totally free you download it it comes with an even newer ML it comes with every it's basically the Windows 7 service pack one era platform SDK um, that's that's the best that's what I use for everything I don't use the news since then the only one I've liked kind of is the Visual Studio 2019 um, but I don't know for sure how far back a binary compatibility that will go you know if you use that Windows 7 1 SDK then that you can still write programs for Windows 10 with that and you can write programs I think all the way back to Windows 95 with it whatever but anyway just ignore what I'm saying this should be fine so you can go through here and you could see like okay what's a U short well it's actually just a type def word well then word something right so let's find that because any of these things in uppercase are like type defs in this situation so I'll do control F and type all capital word oh that's a bad idea huh it's gonna do that so you can see a boolean is a byte whatever it's just everything and then a byte is gonna be a care a char you know a character an 8-bit byte all this stuff oh if you ever wondered when you see Windows API in those uh, in the Windows API calls it's really just a standard call <laughs> you know what I mean it's kind of weird like they added a bunch of junk that was like why didn't they just say standard call all the time you know or whatever I don't know maybe when that came out whatever I don't want to try and make excuses for them and I've heard people try and make excuses but you can dig through here and you can search for something like there's uh, uint 64 like what is that oh it's just a quad word that's all it is so these are what you really care about more um, is just whether or not things are a quad word or 
D word. As you can see, the vast majority of stuff is a D word. So when in doubt, if you just literally put D word for something, you're probably going to work okay. And here's all that stuff like, um, so we can search for, what was that, like STD cons, uh, standard output handle. There it is. So you can see that's anything with this EQU in MASM is just like a uh, kind of like a hashtag define in um, C programming. You know, it's just like a preprocessor kind of a text search and replace thing. So anywhere in your code, if you put std output handle, it's going to just replace that with a negative 11. And then since that convention is followed throughout Windows, then it knows that that's what you want if you supply a negative 11 where it asks for uh, that type of a handle or whatever, right? So by coming through here and searching through these, you don't have to include those files is what I'm getting at. Like we can get rid of windows.inc if we want, but if we do any of those, uh, you know, any of those types that it refers to, we'll have to know and assign it ourselves. So I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm going to leave this like it is for now. Um, how, why wasn't this font big? Okay. So anyway, that's what's going on in these. Like those files are these ink files, right? Which are very similar to their C and C++ counterparts. So I just want to demonstrate that. Same thing with kernel, because it doesn't necessarily know like what stuff is exported by kernel 32. It doesn't know that there's like a write console function in there, you know? So this thing, um, this kernel 32 ink will tell it like there's a write console function and it takes four D words as parameters or whatever. Um, the other thing to notice here is this MASM32 ink and lib. And at first a lot of people just gloss this over and not even really explain it. And I was so confused by it back in the day. What it is, is it is a third party library provided by these MASM32 people, which aren't official Microsoft people, by the way. They're like some other small individual or group of people that have done some stuff to kind of like, you know, just roughly patch some stuff together for you and make things a little easier to get into or whatever. The problem is this MASM Inc. and Live and stuff, you they don't work on 16 or 30 or 64 bit windows. And, you know, it's, I don't know if you're only going to use MASM 32 or a hundred percent compatible deal, you know, then I guess you could use this, but all the stuff that it provides, you can get from your standard C library that's included on like every system. So it, the only like trying to be in their favor of why they might've done this is they included those files because they wanted to offer you a pure assembly way of doing things even though under the hood you're not seeing it they're glossing over what's going on under the hood by providing you with this library my assumption is that under the hood this was in fact they call like that right console function I told you about um, let me get back to there and have that open for a minute that is in the help folder I stuck it here and of course you can drag and drop a shortcut to this folder on your desktop right click drag and drop um, and then that was in, what was it, Win32CHM. So, shrink that down. Okay, so we'll do that uh, console, that right console function again. So we can see how ugly it is. So yeah, it does all that and it wants to know like the number of characters it's going to write. Then it wants you to create a variable like carve out space so that it can tell you how many numbers it wrote. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, which is kind of cool if you really want to get specific of like what exactly, tell it exactly what to do and find out exactly what happened. And maybe you don't want to write till you find an old character, da da da. Yeah, this is low level in that regard. But if you're just wanting to put strings to the console this is obviously way too low level because it's like you got to go run that get handle function to get your 
handle initially, then you got to carve out space for that and save that handle and, uh, you know, refer to that every single time. So it could just very easily start to look very crufty just from writing a few sentences to the console like this. Um, so hence, they have this MASM32 lib thing, and I don't know, it's like just called, what? here it is, excuse me, standard out. You just invoke this function, wherever you see invoke in an MASM type of a thing. Would you mind closing that door? Thank you. Um, wherever you see invoke, it's just calling like a, a C style function or whatever. It doesn't have to be exactly C style, but it's calling like a function is what invoke means. It's high level syntax though, because you can see there's like invoke, the function name, a comma, and then this is one parameter. And what this address thing in MASM is doing is it's basically kind of like the ampersand in C programming where, you know, give me the address of this variable. Don't give me the value of this variable. That's something in ASM, the, like N is in Nancy, right, ASM, not M as in monkey ASM. The NASM actually, uh, they just tell you if you want the address you just provide the variable name and that automatically gives you the address and then if you want the value the contents at that address then you'd wrap it in the square brackets if you're familiar with the masm syntax so you do like this if this was nasm and that's much more consistent because for the rest of masm for the most part if you want an address you just say what it is and then if you want the contents at that address number then you'd wrap it in brackets like that so oh I guess I gotta manually you only get one level of undo and notepad XP I guess oh okay so anyway that's what's going on there is this is kind of like a printf kind of a puts kind of a function within this MASM32 lib. And the thing is, is this doesn't map out to anything else that I know of. I mean, it's kind of self-descriptive. It says it's going to standard out, which generally means like a console of some sort or something, right? Or unless you remap that to be like a file or whatever. Um, and then, so that's gonna call it, it's gonna give it the address of this variable, just like you would in C, you just give it a pointer to that first character, which is effectively giving an address to that variable, right? And then it's gonna invoke exit process, which this is kind of like return zero in C code, right? Right there. Okay, so that is what is going on there. Let's go ahead and file, save as, and run this thing. We're gonna save it into this little source folder I have. I'm gonna switch this to all files from text files. And then don't use any of these other things. Just use ANSI because Windows gets weird. I think it does a byte order mark for UTF-8 even. Um, these Unicodes get weird, whatever. I've just never had good experience with that. So I'm going to stick with the ANSI. And then I'm going to save it, you know, just whatever your documents or your downloads folder, wherever you have write access to for to write a little text file. And I'm going to name this one hello.asm. And you could save the name in quotes if you're worried about it getting a TXT extension or something. Okay, so now we have that saved. We'll jump over to a command window. And you can see I'm already I'm already in my source folder here. And I'm gonna do a dir slash w and we can see there's that ASM file right there. And so if we type ML forward slash question mark, which gives us a handy dandy screen full of command line options here, we can see that um this slash C is a symbol without linking. And I think that's the one problem since I updated to the MASM8. I don't think it can call the linker in one command. So we're gonna have passed that, that slash C whenever we do this. If you don't update to the MSA, MASM8, then you should be able to write like ML hello.asm and then you should be able to do link or slash sub system sub system console and uh, like that and it gets mad about that okay I'm gonna just try it with the this MASM I'm gonna pin the forward slash C to just um, assemble but don't link okay so if you do get a bunch of errors just scroll back to the top one 
and look at what it is. ASCII build, MASM, include Windows Inc, error, symbol type conflict, bool. Huh. Did I not? That's really trippy. So what I'll do is I'll go back to the MASM bin folder and I'm going to rename ml.exe, which is this 8.0. I'm going to just flip them back. I'm going to name this one to uh, dash 8.00. And then this one, I'm going to right click, drag to right there, let go, and do copy here. And it names it with, you know, copy of ml. I'm just going to rename that one to ml.exe. So that's that ML6 one, right? Okay, so now we're back to just the old fashioned one. Now let's try it. Still doing that. Did I accidentally save that file? That's really weird. I've never had this problem. Um, error symbol type conflict structure improperly initialized on 156. Huh. Okay, well, anyway, this would have just printed hello world to the console but I don't care because I don't use those ink files um, other than what I showed you where I just open them up and just dig through them by hand for the few little things I need. It's kind of like if Python programming, you have your import statements and then you can say uh, from whatever package import just a few specific things, right? That's kind of the approach I like to take where it's like, okay, if I need that standard output handle or something, I'll just manually paste that in. I don't need to include this whole Windows ink file with like thousands of lines that I'm not even going to use, you know. So um, we'll get rid of the MASM. One, we'll get rid of, get rid of all that. The only thing we need to do is include that lib because kernel 32, you're almost always, I think I could say always going to have to include. Um, that's, you know, that's without any of the Windows look, but all of the Windows feel, so to speak. Like that's everything under the hood to do with Windows or the core stuff under the hood anyway. That's what kernel is. So you're probably going to have to have that every single time. Um, Yeah, I think you, no matter what, you're going to have to have it because at least to call exit process, even if you don't call anything else. So if you do have a higher level library, it will, you know, it might have some alternate way to exit your process. It's just going to call kernel 32 exit process under the hood for you in that case, you know, so. But anyway, um, I'm just sort of trimming down this code, you'll notice. And what I'm going to do here is I'm also going to add, include, uh, one more lib, include, this one you might be, you should be familiar with, it's MASM32 folder, lib subfolder, and it's Microsoft Visual C runtime dot lib. And what that is, is that's the standard C library. That's what CRT means, right? C runtime library. Um, it has like printf, puts, all those old familiar things like that. Those are all in that file. Why not just include that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And then there's gonna be a standard C library on most any other platform too, so you can just replace that line with whatever in whatever assembler you're using, right? Okay, so anyway, there's that. And now we can leave this define. This is saying define, declare some uh, defined initialized data. If we did a dot data question mark section down here, we could do that and do like a dot data question mark section and then we could do stuff like we could say like my byte and then say declare byte and then leave it uninitialized like that so it would carve out the space but it wouldn't provide it values what this is doing effectively here is kind of like saying this it's kind of like doing a sequence of bytes basically but it just knows to uh do a string like it knows to turn the string that's one of the things the assembler takes care of for you to make it a little prettier to look at. Um, anyway, I just kind of want to basically touch on those a little bit. Okay, so now instead of invoking standard dot out here, we're going to invoke puts. 
Control S to save that, and uh, then it will invoke exit process from there. Okay, so since I got rid of those ink files, what I need to do, this is just sort of like the way I do it, I'll come under each ink file and tab over, not necessary, you know, just sort of like a syntax convention I use, um, and I'll see, so I know I need exit process, and this is a prototype, so it's just one of those crufty keywords you gotta type, and exit process takes one uh, parameter, and guess what, it's a D word. So that's all you gotta do, is that right there. And that lets the um, assembler know, like, you don't, and like I said, I could put this on any line up here. I could put that right here if I wanted to, but I just do that just for myself to know, like, okay, what am I, you know, it's like from kernel 32 lib import exit process. That's kind of like what's going on there. Okay, and then right here, I'm gonna say uh, this is gonna be the puts and it's a prototype and it takes a pointer to a string which that's going to be a d word pointer to the string okay now the deal here is all the windows api stuff that i'm aware of is uh going to be a standard call so we have the option of instead of defining standard call up here we could just write std call right here because this is just saying use you know by default for any of these external functions or whatever use standard call but we also have the option of using this syntax to supply it specifically so that that standard call up there will take care of that api function but right here we have a true c one so we need to pit c because that's saying that's sort of like that extern quote unquote c in c plus plus right to avoid the name mangling um well, even though C does slightly mangle the names, at least Microsoft C, so it, uh, this is telling this, you know, don't use this standard call, use the C one, and so that will make it look for that type of name mangling, which is just a underscore in front of puts, basically, and then it will also, um, tell the, the, the caller, us, we have to clean it, we're responsible for cleaning up the stack. Okay, so we have puts, and then the one thing it's going to take is the address of hello world. So that easily, I think it is. Let's make sure and save it, and then come over here and see if this wants to just work. It assembled, right? So since I didn't, we should be able to do this now. So if you have the ML 8.0, this might not work for you. But, well, I'll just ignore that. Forget this. This should work no matter what you have. So we did the assemble step with the slash C, right? Now we do link forward slash sub system console. And then we want to do hello dot OBJ. What's it saying? Um, we're in converting format from that to cough. Oh, we use the old school one. So one thing we got to do here in that ML6 we have to specifically say cough but in the later ones it's the default so we do that then it linked so that's all I had to do was just force it to be a cough and then you can see right here also um, it gave us some info about those like exit process is uh, it's got the standard call mangling so it's got the underscore and then it's got the at four which means there's going to be one four byte parameter there and uh, that D word and then puts is using the C style syntax where it's just underscore or whatever but that was all just extra error data that dumped out there um, so right here we did with the six one I'm kind of glad that happened so I could illustrate this that you call ML slash C slash cough hello ASM that should work with even eight as well and then as a separate step because all that did was create that OBJ file then to make this exe file you actually have to link it and so we link that and um we just we had to pass subsystem console to it because otherwise it wants to do a windows program you know so we need to tell it hey whatever console you ran from like give this executable give it a console you know what i mean so that type of thing don't just try and run it invisibly in the background and expect it to display a window or anything so now if we type it hello we can see hello world right and I'll show you just to illustrate let's link it without let's link it with subsystem windows like that 
Now we'll run it. It doesn't print hello. It just instantly returns because it's not assigned that console handle deep down under the seams. So it's kind of cool. We looked at that, the stuff around the right console and get handle and all that. So we kind of have an idea of what's going on. Like, oh, it was never assigned. It doesn't know what console to write to, right? So anyway, of course, I go back and just link it back with the subsystem. Hello. And there it is. Hello world. Just like it's supposed to be. Okay. So you can see right there, I removed a bunch of those library or I at least removed MASM32 and other situations I would have removed more got rid of all of those ink files and we just bring in exactly what we want you know like if you know what exit process is you basically know it's that right so otherwise we can come over this handy dandy win32 chm file and just type in exit proc and there we get exit process right and then right here we can see okay it takes one thing a uint and we remember when we were digging in that file a uint is 32 bit right so that's the one downside with this old documentation is it doesn't tell you that but um what was it so there was that one that i wanted to show you just to illustrate for future purpose purposes so uh it's this one and then we were going to go to get Oh, sorry go to to the group and then to get handle and then so right here like we can't see what these numeric values are right there right so I showed you the one way you go into that Windows ink file in the MASM 32 include folder and you search for this this text right for this exact text control F F3 whatever search for it and um, that will tell you or the other option is to just go into a browser. Oops. Um, go into a browser, copy that, paste it, search it. It's not searching it. There we go. All right, then you can see docs.microsoft.com. Windows console get standard handle. That's what you know. Obviously, that's where we just came from right here, right? Get standard handle. Da da da. Um, we want to click through on that. This is going to give us the up to date 2020 whatever documentation. Which, as you can see, it's still the same. Like for one thing, it hasn't even been updated since 2018, and that was probably just to like adjust it for whatever Windows has going with this layout. Um, but I doubt they. You know, this is probably virtually identical. But the cool thing here is what I was talking about is you can see standard output handle D word a negative 11. Like it tells you all that stuff right there. So that it's kind of interesting that they do that now when it's even less relevant because they try and push people more and more away from assembly language programming where you want to know those facts versus back in the day when I would imagine that a lot of people were doing raw assembly language programming more and they probably really need that value. So they had to go search it out the hard way. But anyway, that's where it's at. That's how you can find it. And then let's look like return value if the function succeeds. Da, da, da. We'll get an idea of what that looks like. Then come down here. Oh, yeah, if the function succeeds, da, 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 da. very similar um, stuff there. So, okay, so my point was that it, and then if you want this, what you would do is standard output handle. You just copy that. And then remember it equals negative 11. And you go over your source code. And somewhere, you know, beyond these initial declarations and above this data stuff or whatever, paste in standard handle E Q U negative 11 if you needed it. And you don't even have to do that much. If you wanted down here, if you needed that, you could just put negative 11. If this function doesn't, this is just an example, it doesn't need it right. But I could put negative 11 there and skip that whole thing. Or if I took the time to do that, look it up, copy and paste it, I could type it out like standard output handle, you know, whatever. Like I could type it all out longhand like that too. Just depends on how code, how readable you want your code to be, how important that is to you in that regard. Um, I definitely say keep it, lean towards keeping it simple. So for one, we don't even need it, so I'm not going to import it. Okay, now I want to get away from this invoke thing because to me, invokes like, yeah, we did it just like right now to get it working, but what's going on behind the scenes? Well, invoke is going to preserve the EAX 
the ECX, the EDX registers. It's going to take a copy of all those, push it onto the stack, adjust the stack pointer um, before it makes a call, right? Well, I don't care. I haven't used the EAX registers or whatever. I haven't done any of that stuff right now. So I don't even care if they're preserved. That's three or more cycles that, you know, probably more than three cycles. And memory writes are something to avoid because, you know, if you, especially when you're optimizing an assembly, if you can just stay at the register level as much as possible, you know, and avoid copying stuff to and from memory, just like on, if you're reading stuff off like a spinning disk, how it takes a lot longer to access and read all that data than it does if it's on like on chip inside your computer, right? It's the same thing with um, when you get into the CPU world, everything's so small and quick that if you have to go outside of that like central processing unit to grab something, that takes an exponentially large, even though it might not even be noticeable to us most times, it's taking a lot a very significantly longer amount of time to do that so by uh avoiding those register copies you know and adjusting the stack pointer and that extra complexity we're saving a lot of cpu cycles especially on something that might get ran you know potentially a lot so anyway i like to kind of expose a little bit more of that and to get this in a little bit more portable not necessarily masm specific type of idea here We'll go ahead and put an extra space down on that one. Um, so we're going to just change it to call. And what call does, it's basically a lot like invoke, but invokes higher level, like I said. Call's the more standard one. Um, we're going to push hello, or the address, address of hello world variable to the stack. So we just do that and then just get rid of it right there. So all we do is we, we push our variables in reverse order according to the calling convention. And since we only have one variable, that's the only one we do. So we push that onto our stack, which is like a stack of plates in memory. And then we go call this function and we and it knows to uh, to look for when it's like, hey, this function needs a, a parameter. It knows it's going to, okay, go to the stack and it's going to be right there on the stack. So that's how that works. And the reason we push them in the reverse order is so that when it goes to the stack, that stack of plates, that first plate is going to be that first parameter. And then that second plate will be that second parameter. Like that. So this, in theory, should work. I'm going to control S to save. And then go back over here. Hit up a few times. Get back to there. And hit enter. And we have an error. Syntax error with adder. Oh, you know what? I think that's what maybe that um, dot option case map none, maybe. Maybe that's what was causing all those problems when I got rid of that. Okay, jump back over here. Close that out. This guy's thing. Option case map none. Okay, there's no dot in front of option. Then they do the colon in front of the none, so let's keep it consistent. Okay, save that. Still adder's not working. Push the address of hello world. Why wouldn't this work? That's bizarre. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do copy ml-8.00. Oh, I'm not even in the right folder, am I? I'll browse to that folder real quick. Try not to take forever. I'm trying to wrap it up here. Um, MASM32 bin. I'm going to delete ML. Now I'm going to right click, drag and drop, and copy here. Rename this to just ML.exe. Okay, now we're back into the ML 8.0 world. Let's see what's going on here. Still given that error, syntax error, ADDR. So that's probably right before that I'm doing something wrong. Start push. I'm really just not seeing it. Maybe I don't need address. Oh man, how annoying. 
I can get rid of this cough too. This was so easy before, now it's getting all screwy. Let's see what happens if we just push Hello World. That might just push an H, which will get weird. Yeah, invalid operand. Push ADDR. What else could I be doing wrong? Um, they're not doing any push. There's. That has got to be right. Model case map include D words, puts, proto C data. Code start. One thing we're supposed to put an underscore here. I'm surprised it hasn't complained to me about that yet. And start. Okay. Okay, my mind's just blown right now. Um, why wouldn't that be working? Go to hello ASM here. Do a quick reference on my old stuff. Okay, so this one I'm already... Oh, it's offset. That's right. Another one of those gotchas from... Uh, so you use adder with invoke and you use offset otherwise with call and they both for the most part effectively do the same thing it's just giving you the address of instead of that deal okay so let me go back full with this okay hello asm we're gonna ml slash c it and you can see it assemble we can get away with that because i'm gonna do the cough just in case if anybody is uh, still using the MASM6. So you can see even with eight, you can put the slash cough in there and it was already to the fall, it's not gonna error out. Okay, and then after that we can link it, hit the up key a few times, link to console, boom, it linked. Okay, so now if we type hello, there it is, hello world, it's still working, even though we've now changed it like this, of course. Okay, and then I just wanna demonstrate this and then in theory we're supposed to be able to say link forward slash sub system console that really work low link subsystem console uh, time and dir do that to get the exact current time on here is uh, 1642 this one is 41, but it could have been the tail end. Okay, so now let's see if we do that again. Now we're 1642 for the object, but still 1641 for the EXE. What am I doing wrong here? Yeah, anyway, I think there's a problem with it if you try and call link. If you have the, like I said, the MASM8, and then you're calling the old version 6 linker on the same command line your results are going to be funky so just uh, if you're doing that you know so just remember if you're using ml6 you've got to include the slash cough if you're using ml8 then you got to do this on two separate lines so we do that and then we'll do the link subsystem console okay now if we do DRR, we can see they're both 443 time and they're both updated. Okay, that's working, cool. Is that, I think I wanted to cover maybe a little bit. Okay, I want to go ahead and cover displaying a hello world message box and then we'll call it good from there. Okay, so now we're here. Um, we see that we've replaced it with puts instead of that weird MASM32 like niche little library. We've replaced that with the standard C puts and you can just see how easy it is to drop in that, you know, here's a Windows API call. Here's a standard C library call. That's how easy you can do this stuff from within your deal here. Um, and then for the last trick, 
we want to get rid of puts and we're going to want to include lib and if you're not using the MSAM this 32 distribution thing then you'll have these you can just say you don't have to give the full path to the library just say kernel 32.lib or user 32.lib or whatever and a regular windows like a more modern windows sdk is it, those should be in your path for you know like if you're using like visual studio 2019 or that um platform sdk 7.1 that i recommend um those ones you don't have to include the full path and you just open up their respective command prompts for 32-bit development and that will put all that stuff in your path for you so there's that then the here we go um user 32 so user 32 whenever you do anything like displaying a window or buttons and stuff like that that's all going to be in the user 32 category and you can check in this documentation but we're going to do message box message uh, box right down here and quick info you see right here user 32 lib so uh and then if you know the group if you want all the stuff around creating different dialog boxes and all that but we're not going to get that complex so one thing to note too this also brings up another good point is that anything dealing with strings is going to have an ANSI version of the function and it's going to have a unicode version of the function or i like I said, I'm going to refer to that as ASCII because it's easier. Like ANSI, I think of like ANSI control codes, you know, um, for a terminal, which that's not what this is about. It's more about just the ASCII character set. Um, and then the Unicode stuff is just referred to as wide, as W. So you're going to have the A for ASCII and the W for wide Unicode characters or whatever. But it was pre the finalization of the Unicode standard, so it was like called UCS2 or UCS2, whatever. You know, it was basically like UTF-16 without surrogate pairs, I think, um, which was compatible enough to be overlapping with UTF-16. So for the most part, like uh, if a lot of stuff, if you hear that it uses Unicode, like a programming environment like Java, JavaScript, um, Windows, like stuff like that, it's really using like a kind of like a UTF 16 under the hood of what's going on there. All right. So this is message box. This is the whole uh, prototype for the, the function call. Obviously, it needs a handle of a window, which we can just, it says we can just say null and then it doesn't have an owner. Fine. That's keep it simple for now. Um, a null terminated string. So null terminated just means a zero terminated in our assembly language world which we need to explicitly do. When you pass a string in C or higher level languages, they automatically add a little hidden zero for you. Um, we've got to do that. Then the caption would be like right here, this Windows 32 programming reference. This is the caption of this window, the title. Um, and then a type sets specific bit flags that determine the contents behavior of the dialog box. So you can decide if you want it to be like a message box, um, you know, just an OK button, or if you want to be OK and cancel, or yes or no, or yes or no and cancel, and all those combinations and stuff like that. For now, we're going to keep it simple with MBOK, which I happen to have already looked up, and that's a zero. So you could even pass a null there, or just plain zero in what we're doing, I guess. Um, so user 32 lib, and then we need message box and we can't just do plain message box so we'll, we'll get an error because that's actually translated really quick behind the scenes with C programs when we go to compile them it goes and it looks and it says like are you defining Unicode in this program and if you are it will secretly call message box W and if you're not it will call message box A so since we're using the plain American ASCII set we uh, We'll just stick, you know, message box American. <laughs> I don't know, whatever you want to call it. So that's what we're importing. And this, of course, is the prototype for that. And it takes, what does it take? It takes a handle to a window, which we know is a D word. It takes a long pointer to a C uh, terminated string or a T string. I think a T string is the, a string that means that it can be either type, long or short or whatever. Um, anyway, it's a long pointer to a string. This is a long pointer to a string, and this is an unsigned integer. 
So we know handle to a Windows 32-bit, which is a D word. We know the unsigned integer is an unsigned 32-bit value, which is a D word. Whether it's signed or not, it's a D word. Um, and then we also know that longs, that it has to be long, long to be 64-bit, right? So we know a long pointer is 32-bit. So this is all just a bunch of junk to say we need four D words. Okay, so we'll go back over to our thing here. And if you do include, if you get those ink files working and stuff, which like, then, uh, huh. If you get, what was I saying about the ink files? Oh yeah, if you get those ink files working, then you don't have to worry about this. This is, these prototypes are defined for you under the hood by those ink files, but we like to do stuff manually. So as you can see, it doesn't take a whole lot of work. D word comma. You just do that four times. Okay, so four D words, double check that was right. There's four D words. And then does it give us anything back? Come down here, way down here. Return values is zero. Um, if there's not enough memory to create the box, if the function succeeds, the return value is one of the following menu items returned by the dialog box. So it will return whatever they click on. Makes sense. Okay. So instead of puts, we're going to call message box A. And then we're just going to push all the values in reverse order. So we can, we know by looking at this, we needed, um, and you can use online reference too, of course. We need the handle, the text, the caption, and the type. So we can literally just come right here. Push handle was null, so that's a zero. Push text is there. So they're really kind of in order going down like this, you know, like, and then this is the caption. So we could even create a caption. We'll say offset. Well, for now, we'll leave no caption and it will just say error, which is kind of creepy, but that's what we'll say now. And then for the last thing, the message box type, that'll be MBOK, which is just a zero. Okay, so I'll show you that real quick here. We'll go back to uh, my computer, go to the MASM Inc. Sorry, keep going back out of there. And then we'll go find a uh, Windows. Windows Inc. We'll open that back up. Just leave it open now, all right? And um, I'm going to find MB underscore OK. And there we can see 0H, which means zero hexadecimal, you know, which is a zero in any number format, really. So any of the ones I'm familiar with. So there we can see there's that. Or what I could do instead of that, if I really wanted to, is up here somewhere. I could do uh, MBOK equals zero. I'm not even going to put the H. Um, and then we can just say MBOK. Is that the right spot to put that? Double check against here. Style of the message box in the last one. That's it, the last one. Okay, so control S to save that. Does that have everything we need? I think so. Come back over here to our source, source folder and we will get the time to make sure everything's 1653. I'm gonna say ML forward slash C forward slash cough. Hello ASM. And then we're gonna do the link. And then do DIR, make sure 1653 or later for those. Yeah, so they're updated. Hello. There it is, hello world. It says for the caption and it's blank for the message, so I obviously swapped those. Okay, so hello world was supposed to be here. That was supposed to be a zero. This was supposed to be hello world. Or wait. Yeah, because they're pushed right to left. Okay, that's, I got backwards, got too excited. So this is the far right parameter. 
this is the second to far right parameter this is the second parameter so this one needs to be null which message box ok happens to be null also and then that very last parameter so just think of it kind of like this is its tail this is your call and then it's dragging its tail with its first parameter second parameter third parameter last parameter mb ok all right come back over here we need to assemble and link it and then we'll do hello and then you can see the error is normal it's supposed to say that if we don't provide it a value and then hello world and then we can you know it's a regular message box we can move it around um and then so and then i just want to demonstrate that i can change this to zero since it's the same thing as that equals definition right there and then we can also do an uh do another message in here and say this will be uh window caption and we're going to define a series of bytes and it's going to say hello title bar and then we got to end that with that zero that's that null that slash uh zero equivalent the hidden one in c and that is a c style string technically what well, whenever you end a string a zero terminated string that's what's called a c style string but we just have to do it manually so we don't get that automation that C provides. Window caption. So I just created a new variable called window caption right here, you know, global. And uh, then we just say, hey, push the address, the offset of that as that uh, third parameter. Just like over here, it said the third parameter address of the title box of the message. So we're going to do that. Control S. Go over to there and say uh, MLC, COFF. Hello dot ASM and then we're gonna do link subsystem. This if you do the link help, it's gonna show it in all caps. You know that's why I was typing in all caps sometimes. The thing with the development tools is every once in a while some of the stuff is case sensitive. So if you get an error, make sure you're getting the case exactly right. But with this particular one, you don't have to do it case sensitive. And then we're gonna do the hello dot object file. Okay, hello, and there we can see we've got the hello title bar and the hello world part in our cool little message box that isn't owned by anything. Um, but even though it isn't owned by our window, one thing I was habitually doing was doing subsystem console over here. So you can see it has a console. Like this is paused, we haven't got our prompt back. As soon as I click OK though, our prompt's gonna come back. Um, so I'll click OK. See, there we got our prompt back. And then that enter key I had hit through went through. Um, what we can do, though, is when we link it, we can either do subsystem windows or just leave it out. And then when we run hello, now you can see, even though the, now the window's there independently, but if you look over here, I can type stuff in the console. I can type hello again. And then we get another hello box. You know what I mean? So what it is, is I said, hey, subsystem windows, not subsystem console. So it didn't automatically assign a console to it. So that's what's going on there. Um, they're independent of the console as well as the program. That null made it independent of any other windows as the first parameter. OK. And last thing I want to get into was the wide character Unicode functions, of course to show you that. So the thing is with MASM, they never really went full on with, they've always done for the most part, the absolute minimal necessary. Ever since it became a non-product, it's not sold as an individual product since the 90s. So since then, and they're doing the same thing with their C compiler, if you notice, they will only implement the C standard um, just as much as necessary to implement the C++ standard. So they're trying to keep abreast of the latest C++ at whatever time a compiler comes out. Um, but it will look like, what's going on? You know, there's not a, there, it's, tw C, uh, excuse me, Visual C 2019, and it barely has full uh, C99 support by now. It's like going on 20 years, and they still don't have 100% C99 support, almost. But um, the reason is, is because they only, they're, their focus is it's a C++ compiler. And being a C++ compiler, you're supposed to be a C compiler as well. 
but you only need to be a C compiler to the extent that it supports that C++ standard, if that makes any sense. Um, but it does, it is a full ANSI C, C89, C90, all the Microsoft, you know, 32-bit compilers are fully, uh, I'm pretty sure, at least since 4.0 and beyond, I'm pretty sure, are all uh, ANSI C compatible, like that C90 standard. And the more into the 2000s you get, the more C99, and now they're even getting more C11 and stuff like that. But I mean, any of the stuff you really care about and that really matters, it's going to be there. For me personally, I, the vast, vast majority of the time, I just code in pure ANSI C. You know, there's the very few things that you even care about, like using C style comments and stuff like that, you can do because that's part of the C standard, right? So, anyway, that's something to know. And then the same thing with MASM, the ML uh, assembler, or the 64 bit version is called ML64. It's not the same like CL their command line C compiler and linker, it has a, it's the same for the 64 bit and the 32 bit one, but ML is actually ML 64 for the 64 bit one. And it's a whole different world too. You can't, you're not gonna accidentally, um, I doubt it may, it might be possible to like, yeah, I think maybe you could very carefully craft a simple program that was both, that compiled as 32 or 64 bits, but um, beyond anything like that, you're not gonna accidentally, Code, you know when you're coding, you know, assembly so low level, you know which architecture you're targeting, usually. So, we've got window caption, da 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 da. So, what we can do now, what I was saying there is that these are the old ASCII bytes for that message box A. Well, what we're going to do is bring in this cursor control is not quite what I like. We're going to bring in the wide character one right here and we're going to define words instead of bytes. So the very first thing we got to do is, here's the first trick. We put everything in between quotes and commas right here. Like every character, we just go like this. Even the space. This sure would have been better in my syntax highlighting editor. Um, so that's one way to do it right there. And then the other, oh no, sorry, I forgot something. So we need to do a zero comma. Um, zero comma. Oops. So this is the, uh, the empty surrogate, I guess. Well, that's not the right term for it. It's a, uh, it's crazy to do without syntax highlighting. Um, because it's UTF-16, like I was saying, you know, you're only getting the byte from that letter because the Unicode value of all of these characters is, and then even that zero needs another zero after it. So you end up with triple zero there. Okay, let me go ahead and um, change my font size back down a notch or two. Okay, so we have H0, E0, L0, L0, O0, space 0. It's making sure it's a, everything's all right. Okay, so from here back, we can see that there's the letter and then there's a 0 because in an Intel syntax, we have little Indian byte ordering. So when this feeds all the bytes in, it's going to feed the low byte first, which is little Indian, and that's the H, the the byte value of the character H, right? And then immediately after that, where that high byte would go, it's going to feed a zero. And then it's going to go back and feed, you know, what's effectively a low byte and then the high byte. Um, if we were to define these as words, then we'd probably prefix that with the zero. You know what I mean? Because it's effectively like we're putting in eight bits that represents the character and then we're padding it with a bunch of zero bits to make it 16 bits you know um and the reason we're doing that ordering with the zeros like i just said because it's little indian if it was big indian then we'd push the zero first and then at the end here the reason we have three zeros is this one zero this is the the padding byte for that and then we literally want to end the string with a zero, but that zero itself needs to be a 16-bit value, as far as I know. Maybe that's not necessary, but I'm pretty sure it is. 
Um, we could test that out in just a second. And then window caption. For this one, what we can do here, another trick is just to say define word instead. And then the shortcut we saved there is we can just do the characters without the zero because each character will be given a word value. So these are the two options here. And of course, there could be a macro made that would automatically do this, but this was something that the uh, compiler writer people didn't feel. What's going on here? Um, they didn't feel it was necessary to they didn't feel it was absolutely necessary so they just went ahead and didn't do it and they're like okay somebody else can write this because we haven't you know i guess tight budgets or whatever they don't want them doing anything they shouldn't be doing so now that we've done all that this should work effectively the same we should get the same results but under the hood it's going to be unicode so i'll go ahead and find that uh assemble Missing double quotation mark in string on 16, line 16. Come on, notepad. Why? This thing's goofing off more than it usually does. Okay, I don't have line numbers in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. A, G, L, L, O. Gotta be one of these is wrong. Oh, there it is. That one. I thought that looked funny there. Okay. Cool, it assembled. Now let's do the link. And we're going to do subsystem. We'll get rid of the subsystem. Automatically Windows. Oh, it can't be inferred. Okay. My bad. It has to be Windows. Subsystem Windows. Okay. There it is. Um, now, hello. And there we go. That is a Unicode version of that. Let's make sure that that's a recent... Um, time and then dir. What do we have here for time? 170551, 1705 for those, which you can just subtract two from that far right one and you get the five to be able to convert it back to that time. Um, so yeah, that, that was the Unicode hello deal right there, right? So it's all we can't even tell that we're that that's Unicode because it's the same characters. But what we can do is something kind of cool is we can come in here and replace that with a 9676 or something. Um, add a character, a Unicode character there. And then if we go back to this, and then type hello. See that little Unicode character in there? Actually, there was one I had earlier that was cool looking. Um, let's go to Unicode block drawing characters. There's a thing to get to the basic um, Unicode characters. I think it might be on Wikipedia. But yeah, if we go in here and we get one of these, like, so we see this one's 256 and then O for this little pipe with opening. So let's do that, 2560. Come back over here, and then we'll put that in the Hello World part. So 2560. Excuse me. Um, so that's bigger than an 8-bit value there. I don't know. That that might be kind of goofy. Let's look at what happens here. Initializer magnitude too, too big. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. We need to combine the two bytes right there. Um, which is possible, but I just don't want to dink with that right now. I'll just do it right here. 2560, I think it was. Okay. And do hello. Oh, it's too small to see. Or else it's not even printing. Okay, so to do that, we can switch this one to define word also. In the 64-bit, you can't. you have to do those zeros if you are jumping ahead like that. So you know, like you can't even do this define word thing, I don't think. 
It's been a minute. Oh, trying to hurry up here. This is pretty much it for what I wanted to show. And like that. And let's do the, was it 2560? 2560. Save that. Oh well, anyway, you get the picture. It was cooler when I did it before. I picked some cool looking block characters and they like really stood out and then it was... I know that um, XP is pretty limited for Unicode support, but some of these older block characters... Ooh, yeah, like those ones. What's this one? Come on, give me that value. Don't send me to a whole nother page. How weird that it won't even give us those character values because those are real. Whatever. Just experiment though and um, find some characters that work and everything. So that's that. I just want to show you that, you know, like when you go through these tutorials and stuff, they'll do a lot of this extra stuff like with Invoke and, you know, it's just kind of like high level and it's not really showing you what's going on beneath the seams. Sorry that this took so long and everything, but um, I plan on coming through. This is kind of my focus of my direction and, you know, creating some more usable stuff. Then I'd like to, you know, once we get like a grasp on this uh, stuff here, jump into the 64-bit and maybe even back into the 16-bit. Don't forget about the CHM help file. And on that note, don't forget about any of those files. Go dig in that M MASM32 folder handful of cool little programs that come with it like icon editors resource editors maybe um then what is it go into that help folder if i can find that and so in this help folder there's that ms i can't even say those words uh the library reference for that lib file that i said i don't like so if you come in here it will tell you like this is your reference for all that stuff like console mode functions clear screen standard out there's the standard out will display zero terminated string da 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 so if you do want to you know or just get an idea of how somebody went through and implemented a mid-level library for it or whatever there's that um help for the q editor there's the help we dropped in there there's that win asm tutorial we downloaded then this masm32 this one's good this is more masm specific not the lib specific but just using MASM like the Microsoft macro assembler and it's telling you what why use invoke what is it and they're explaining it they go through a lot of this I don't totally agree with them on all of it but it's really cool um, they're saying the traditional is you push this one two three four parameters call the function then return values in EAX right well with invoke you just do it with a bunch of commas instead and it's like uh, is that really that much bad a difference I like I don't know. It just doesn't justify it to me necessarily. I think if you do these in their own separate blocks, you get so used to looking at them that it's not even a big deal between that or invoke. Of course, invoke is a little bit cleaner and simpler looking, but then you lose all that power. You don't see what's going on. You don't. Another thing they're not mentioning is that there's um, they should have pushed the uh, the several registers to the stack before they even push these parameters because that's what invoke is doing also you know so technically it could get even dirtier with the traditional syntax but you have access to specifically whatever you want um, if you just dig through this whole thing like every one of these pages just about is worth of course this one not so much some of these are missing like that one's missing right but if I come back here and pick uh, data that one's missing huh there we go. Echoes there, you know, so it's hit or miss on some of them if they're there or not. But uh, some of them are. And then you get your register summary. Some of it's almost just like plain old x86 kind of references style stuff. Your ASCII character references. Um, yeah, so there's all that stuff. Really cool to go through and at least skim through, maybe even read it. What else? There's this ASM intro, which gives you talks about the flat memory model and stuff kind of coming more from a 16 to 32 bit perspective more so than a 64 to 32 bit perspective but still it all applies and it's like protected memory 
all this stuff. And even if you know this stuff, this is really good. If you remember Dev C++ kind of had some cool help files with it, just short and sweet. That's what this stuff is. It like comes through just, I don't know, even if you already know this, it's a really nice nostalgic uh, perspective on it and very concise, very, very well done for the most part. Um, I started to come in and read them again. I'm going to make myself try to maybe come in and just read them all again. They're showing you like working with structures, which is a common thing to do in Windows. Here it is in just a few pages, you know, of like how to handle dealing with structures, the register preservation convention that I was talking about in that other one that they didn't mention, where you have to uh, preserve, you know, if you care about what's in those registers, you push them to the stack. Then if the function itself cares about what's in those registers, if they want to use them, then they got to push those in the stack and blah, 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 all that crap. Um, yeah. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Maybe that will help you get a little bit up to speed with that stuff.